We are at one o'clock. So I'd like to welcome all of you for joining us for our Teaching Ed Technologies webinar. I'm Jenny Reese. I'm your North Central Regional Vice Chair, also Chair of this committee, and we also have with us today Stan, Mc Stan McKee, um, who's our Northeast Regional Vice Chair, and Matt Lawler, who's our South East Regional Vice Chair. So appreciate all their help on this committee as well. Today, our topic is time-lapse photography, and we're really excited about this because it's, it's something that we know more of our extension staff and faculty have been using for programming. And with us speaking today are um, Justin McNeekin with the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension and John Tyson with Penn State. And so I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves. And, and guys, I can't recall if you decided that you're going to have an intro about time lapse beforehand or if you're just going to do it in your, in your presentations. But Why don't we just go ahead and tell our stories as we present, I think, and then at the end, if there's any commonalities, we can talk about it. That sounds great. So for everyone attending today, I'm going to ask that you please mute your microphones if you're not speaking, and we will let Justin go ahead and share his screen. If you have questions throughout, feel free to add them to the chat box, and our presenters may just ask for questions during their presentations as well. So thank you for joining us today, and Justin, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, Jenny, for the invite to give this talk. And, and uh, I've uh, spoken with a, a few people that are on this call already about this, this particular topic, but uh, it's of interest to me because I deal with a lot of things that, that change over time. Uh, and demonstrating that to uh, clientele has, was a challenge initially, still is. I mean, there, there are all challenges with that, but this is a tool that I've found to be quite useful. So, I'm a crop protection and cropping system specialist located about 30 minutes north of Lincoln at the Eastern Nebraska Research and Extension Center, which if some of you know that used to be the Agriculture Research and Development Center. Uh, but my uh, area of research is kind of uh, somewhat broad. I deal with ear formation issues in corn and then uh, some hail in both corn and soybeans. And that's certainly you'll see some videos on time lapse from that. Um, and then uh, more recently here getting into cover crops and, and insect pests. Uh, and so you, you'll see how uh, time-lapse cameras have been part of uh, past projects for me. And, and uh, my, my goal really is to kind of excite you in the idea of pursuing this uh, in your own programs and provide you the, the tools necessary to get there. Uh, and so, so that's kind of today's talk and I'll get uh, advanced here. So these are, you know, the, the rest of the goals, you know, why use time-lapse cameras? What's, what's the value, at least for me? Um, I'm going to go through some final products. They're, they're kind of sped up, uh, you know, sped up anyway in the terms of time lapse, but short little clips of videos to give you a sampling of, of the uh, different uh, uh, potential uses from, say, lab to greenhouse to field, um, and then go through the component and, and components and setups that I've used, and, and I know uh, we'll be talking about some other ones later, but uh, then developing a final product. You know, I think this is when I started doing this, a few years ago, uh, this was probably the most challenging part for me was how do I take this video that's come from this camera and use it for something uh, that I want to, to maybe stand by itself. Um, and then some do's and don'ts. Uh, Jenny asked me to put these together and I, I really appreciate her asking because I, I hadn't really thought a lot about them. Uh, and so putting that together actually reminded me of a few things as we put out cameras this spring that we don't forget to do. So to start, why use time-lapse cameras? Um, you know, they are uh, a tool for discovery. Uh, you'll see that in one of the first videos that we, we put up here, or uh, one of the first ones to come up. Um, they, they provide insights into things that we see in the field and can create conversations through Twitter on. Um, they are these uh, visual interpretations of changes over time, uh, whether it's virus expression in a field or, or subtle changes in plant growth. Uh, they do avoid barriers, you know, and we often within our disciplines have a lot of technical jargon that comes with that we don't even realize and having this visual aid um, can uh, help people join the conversation even when uh, it's something more complicated. Um, in the case of hail, uh, these high stakes, high stress situations, it provides a tool to help people understand maybe the need to wait following a hail app or, or hail 
uh, situation uh, to make a, a correct decision on whether or not to replant a crop. Uh, and then these standalone products uh, really make a continuous source for conversation with people uh, you'll see around the world uh, by, by having something you can leave out, say, on YouTube and allow people to get a hold of you uh, and ask questions about it. So hopefully that kind of wraps around that idea of why I've used time-lapse cameras. So we're going to go through a series of examples uh, ranging with different groups that would be involved um, and uh, to give you some of the sampling here. So the first one is youth education. Uh, this is a soybean aphid reproduction video. Uh, this took me very little time to put together. I more or less took a time-lapse camera, put it on a leaf uh, and with a bunch of aphids and left it for about seven hours. Uh, came back, scrolled through the video, found where aphids were reproducing, uh, and then cut out a few small videos to put on top of that. So uh, very simplistic uh, video, uh, but uh, a good way of showing kids how uh, aphids reproduce. And we did this for an open house that we held in entomology. Uh, another one here is translating results. Um, this is actually four videos put together uh, showing thymethox, which is a speed treatment for controlling uh, aphids uh, and aphid resistance. So I was working with a graduate student at the time who's uh, since graduated, but uh, he had these resistance ratios and I was asking what that really meant. And so um, we, we decided to put together this time lapse and you can see we have these control treatments in the top here. Um, uh, top right hand corner and you can see most of the aphids have died but uh, watching that video which some of these you have to watch a few times you can see how erratic their movement and behavior is relative to this lab selected colony on the bottom so just putting some numbers to something like that you know or the visual aid uh, really helps in translating uh, some of the value uh, to that type of thing and this was presented at the north central soybean Research program as part of their grant um, as a tool for communicating resistance to growers um, so here's a greenhouse example uh, this was done as part of a uh, RNAi project with uh, Anna Velez uh, here at the university. Uh, she's an insect toxicologist, and she was concerned on whether or not um, the western corn rootworms you see in this this video were uh, actually feeding on plant tissue uh, that was expressing RNA or double-stranded RNA. And so this provided us a way of of kind of quantifying that consumption, at least in terms of area consumed over time, uh, and, and and a neat way of talking to growers for defoliation and, and other things. Uh, here's a hail damaged example. Uh, this was taken a few years ago. Um, there's a still video, the day of the hail event, and then you can see plant response over a five day period. Uh, this is quite a bit sped up from the original video that's available on YouTube, uh, but it shows you how rapid that response can be uh, to growth. And doing this even earlier shows uh, uh, some real differences as far as just giving a couple days uh, of wait period. And uh, I, I loosely measure, measure these or put these up as uh, um, measure, metrics for impact. Um, you know, it's difficult to measure impact, but you can see that we do get a number of views uh, from putting these types of videos out. Uh, National Crop Insurance Service adjusters have used them as a way to, to communicate that need to wait. Um, and then uh, we've, we've tested this with a number of people uh, looking at um, you know, how it's improved their evaluation or understanding of hail damage and, and can see that uh, you know, we, we've had some success with that. Uh, another one here is a field observation. Um, this is from this past spring. Uh, you know, I just put this camera out to capture emergence on corn. Uh, I was surprising the number of things. We had a wet and cold spring. Uh, here you can see some fungus gnat larvae that moved into this, this photo. And in fact, Jenny was involved in a call on a number of fungus gnat larvae showing up in the field. And so this was a way of communicating you know, some of their behavior and why they might cluster like that on the soil surface, as well as other physical characteristics like soil cracking here following rain and it drying out. Uh, so even putting one of these out and capturing it on a regular basis, uh, if you're communicating with clientele via like a blog or uh, you know, putting this maybe in for us in CropWatch articles, uh, this is a way of, of starting that conversation, getting people interested in learning more about the process behind it. The last one here is a, an acoustics combination with time lapse. Uh, this was done in combination with uh, oh, um, there we go in in combination with Doug Cook, who's now uh, back in the U.S. here. Uh, but we were interested in in listening to corn grow, and so that pop popping noise, that Rice Krispies noise that hopefully you can hear, um, is uh, these piezoelectric contact microphones you can see right at the bottom of the image here, shoved into the plant. And so we were trying to quantify growth rates. And so we utilize these time-lapse cameras in a rather crude method on this particular video uh, to quantify, you know, what was 1.25 inches of growth in an eight-hour period, but showing that growth rate over time. 
Uh, it was really fun showing this to growers at, at extension events. They ask a lot of really interesting questions, growth of corn, uh, green snap and other things. So um, just a, a fun way of, of having that conversation. Uh, this one's been viewed quite a bit, about 13,000 views as of, uh, today and around 30 countries. Uh, but, you know, you, you can get some metrics potentially from that on who your clientele is that's viewing something like this. Uh, I do have one more example here. This is just to show kind of actually the complication of doing a more long-term time lapse, uh, which was done in a field uh, in 2016. Uh, this is a virus screen with mite that transmits viruses to wheat in the fall. And then you see this expression in the spring in terms of stunting and yellowing. And so you can see we got a large amount of rain. In fact, we captured a large rainfall event that if you weren't out there within the few hours that showed up, uh, you would have never known these plots would have been nearly underwater. Uh, so it does offer the opportunity to kind of capture this long-term view of, uh, of what things look like and communicate with growers that uh, these symptoms show up gradually as temperature increase uh, in the spring. And, and so depending on what you're dealing with, this may be uh, opportunity. Any sentinel targets that, that change over a longer period of time are usually fairly good for this type of thing. Okay, so I'm going to transition to the the uh, uh, components and setup of this camera uh, and then a little bit on final products. I'm going to offer you a resource at the end. Uh, hopefully you can take this, but there's a QR code at the very end of this talk uh, that has the uh, developing a final product process in it uh, and some examples from, from the software that I use. And so if you want to walk through those resources, that would be helpful for you. And by chance you can't get it if you email me or, or Jenny or... Uh, we'd be able to get those resources to you um, later. So uh, the components and sets, this, this is what was used in all those previous videos that you saw. Uh, I use a Brino TLC 200 Pro camera. These do range in price, uh, depending on actually the time of the year, but uh, typically you can get them for about 175 bucks. Uh, you use these uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, and it comes with a four gigabyte SD card, but I really recommend just going out and purchasing a 32 gigabyte SD drive. In fact, purchase a couple of them, maybe two for every camera that you might have. And that way, if you're doing a longer term time lapse, you can quickly switch those out. Uh, a tripod is definitely an anchor that thing in the ground if you're doing this outside. Um, and then this uh, casing that you can get for it, uh, which protects it. You'll see that if you click on a Brino on, on say Amazon, you'll see that case uh, that, that you can potentially get with it. Um, make sure the cases are well sealed. Um, and it's worth it even for the greenhouse too. You don't want to get your stuff accidentally watered. Um, we can go through stories that have happened to me in the past uh, in the process of learning these through these cameras. But uh, then the software is, uh, what I've used is Camtasia. There are a number of different software programs. Uh, this is not a, any means an expert software package that will give you all the things you ever want to do. But I think it's a simple enough to work with uh, that uh, it's been my choice to go to, to to build all the previous products that you saw. Uh, as far as setup, I get a lot of questions on this um, depends on what you're trying to to capture you know for field settings five minutes between photos 20 frames per second playback um, limiting that time frame of capture to daytime only really speeds up the process after you get these these things back from the field the exported product of this is is literally a video so it's it's individual photos uh, compressed to a video uh, is what's taken off the SD cards when you put it back on your computer if you do insect movement of any kind or something really close up uh, that has movement or a shorter period of time, we're only capturing uh, this for maybe a few days at the most, like the uh, aphid video, you know, that was seven hours or two to three days. Uh, you can really speed up those captures and, uh, and the frame rates, can, you could definitely play around with these. There's a lot that can be done in Camtasia to, to make them go faster or slower, uh, depending on what uh, timing you have to show that video. Uh, and the manual has great suggestions towards the back on uh, different types of environments and how to set up these cameras. So as I mentioned, it's exported as a raw video and MP4. Uh, videos are separated by day. So if you shoot 100 days of video, you're going to have 100 little videos. Uh, but because they come out as an MP4, it makes it relatively quick uh, to put these in. Uh, you can stitch them all together, uh, placing them in things like iMovie or directly in Camtasia. If you have 100 videos, you'll definitely stress Camtasia to get these in. Uh, you can do it in smaller sections. You can add other things like images and notes to these uh, as well to, to enhance them. You saw in the, the four videos side by side, but side by side of videos. And the examples that I have, one of those is a side by side and how to put that together. Um, of course, there are others like Adobe uh, related books. 
Uh, I'm just not as good uh, with those types of software, a little more complex, but if you already have a background in these, then I certainly suggest uh, you, you go that road and, and you can generate a higher quality product. So I like Camtasia because it's much like a drag and drop software. Um, you can see the, this is actually a GoPro video uh, that was shot, but uh, similar applies to time lapse. You drag and drop your videos, they're indicated on the bottom, and then um, where you want to place them, and then you simply add in whatever text you'd like to pop up and when you'd like it to pop up and how long you'd like it to be there just by sliding the bars that are uh, inside that uh, to, to the, the amount of time frame you want them to exist. Uh, so pretty simple uh, type software. There's freeze, you can freeze the frame, uh, which was done for this video, uh, but you could also do it for a time lapse if you wanted to stop a specific point like we did with the fungus network to uh, you know, amplify something that's, that's happening. Um, so the, the hands-on activity, which is not really hands activity, it's something for you to do later, uh, has, um, you know, it's adding text, adding images, freezing frames, and multiple videos. Uh, it's included in resource at the end, and again, I'll share that with Jenny in case you don't get it, uh, and, but you could access it that way as well. Uh, here's just an example, multiple videos, to show you what these look like. Um, there's a drag and drop of one video here. You can see it just pops in. I literally drag it from my desktop in there. Uh, a second video on top of that, and initially you don't see either video, uh, but if you you know kind of peel down the corner of one, you'll see that that in fact there's two videos in there. Um, I hadn't had my coffee yet this morning, so it took me a while to get my my screen to full size. But there you go, there's two videos. So it's that simple of of a software to work with. Um, you can resize those to essentially the four quadrants that I had. Uh, so pretty easy to work with. Okay, so you know we've kind of gone through uh, the components and set up how to develop some of the final products or at least a, a sampling of what that might look like if you decide to go further with this. Now I just want to briefly cover some do's and don'ts. Uh, so some do's, uh, double check the focus on these cameras. Uh, as you see in the image here to the right, uh, it's this uh, manual adjustment. You loosen off this little screw on the side. Um, you know, if I'm doing this and I have a one-time shot, which is in a lot of cases, I'll focus the camera in. Uh, set it to as soon as possible capture, let it run for a minute, and then play it back on my laptop in the field to ensure that I have a good focus on that uh, particular uh, item. Uh, the day and night starts are really important. If you're not capturing at night, you know, don't waste your camera battery or having to you know, squeeze in all those frames on every single day. Uh, make sure that's set. And that kind of comes in combination with number three. Check the time settings and make sure they're correct. Uh, the last thing you want is your camera turning on at night when you thought it was day and shutting off during the day. Um, and set reminders to replace batteries. Uh, lithium ion batteries last for a long time, uh, but it's, it's always worth uh, getting out there, um, you know, and setting that reminder to make sure you don't lose an opportunity. Uh, make sure you double check the seals on the outdoor case. I've lost a few cameras doing that. Brino's pretty good at replacing them. Although if I call every year, they probably will stop replacing cameras. So double check those seals. Uh, you know, if you're gonna get a lot of these, buy an external hard drive. Definitely want to store them on site from your computer and other things so that if something happens, you still have access to them. And I mentioned this earlier, but buy extra SD cards. Uh, they're really cheap, eight to 10 bucks, I'll buy an SD card. Uh, so uh, well worth it when you're trying to, to quickly get some data from these in the field. Uh, the don'ts, don't use alkaline batteries during the winter. Uh, they will actually explode uh, or leak. So uh, best to use a lithium ion anyway. Uh, don't assume the settings stay the same either. Uh, if the camera runs out of battery power, all the settings will probably reset, uh, including the year. So take time to double check those. Uh, you can use those, uh, don't use those small SD cards for those long-term shots. Uh, go ahead and get a 32. And then after you've run these once, you'll need to format them. So uh, be sure to get in uh, format as an ms -DOS FAT32 file, which you'll see if you're on a PC, I don't think you have much to worry about, but if you're on a Mac like me, uh, this is something you need to double check. Uh, otherwise, it'll throw an error when you put it in your, your camera. Uh, you'll know before you set it up and put it out in the field, but that's uh, one of the things that's happened to me. Uh, so in summary, it provides an opportunity to connect with clientele in new ways. Um, software doesn't require a degree in computer programming, which I think is helpful in getting started. You know, try those videos. Uh, watch for the do's and don'ts and to avoid those simple mistakes. I've certainly made a lot of them. Um, and you know the opportunities and use of this really depends on the individual and what they're trying to do. Um, so I really think just hopefully what you saw from the videos is the extent of, of what you could do with something like this. Um, you want to learn more? There's the uh, QR code, and uh, I can give that to Jenny. I think I've run right up to my time here, uh, so I'll, I'll hand it back over to Jenny. 
That sounds great, Justin. And we could actually just have you, um, if you wanted to just leave that up, oh. that last slide up for a moment. If there's any questions, I think we'd have about five minutes or so for questions if anyone wanted to ask you any specific ones right now. Sure. And that way they can have a little bit more time to get your information in that QR code. Sure thing. So does anyone have questions for Justin right now? You'll notice on this slide there's a bonus on infographics and Jenny's seen some of the infographics, but in that same video is how to get started building your own graphics and PowerPoint. So. Uh, that's that's free of charge. <laughs> okay, Justin, a question. Can hunting or trail cams be used? Yeah, so uh, we certainly looked at those initially. Uh, the issue is, and, and I'm not familiar with all trail cams, so I'm, I'm only indicating the ones I've seen, uh, is it depends on what you want to use them for. Uh, so if you're looking to do some of the close-up shots you saw on like uh, the soybean aphids or or that plant growing in the field, that initial emergence, uh, the focal distance on those is, is not, uh, you can't get as close as you can with the, the Brino. Uh, so that manual adjustment, if you do find a trail cam like that, you could use. And they're certainly cheaper, I think, for the most part, at least what I saw, they were cheaper uh, than the Brinos. But uh, if you're looking for having some flexibility with the camera, um, you know, and doing some close up well as distant, I, I would make the jump for the, the TLC 200. Um, if you have one already, uh, then, uh, you know, just understand you got some limitations with what you want to use it for. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of all in the, the end use and what the intentions are. Okay, thank you, Justin. Thanks, Jenny. I'll go ahead and turn it over to John and then we'll open it up for questions again at the very end. Okay. All right. And John, I'm gonna have you go, yep, go ahead and do the full screen. All right, I will attempt. You hear me all right now? Yep, sounds all right. good. All right, well, thanks everybody for inviting me in. Um, John Tyson, I'm an ag engineer here at Penn State Extension. Um, most of my time is spent, probably 90 plus percent of it spent with dairy housing. And this was sort of one of a, a story of how some of us ag engineers here at Penn State got into time-lapse cameras. And I always start off by putting up the cheesy uh, definition from Wikipedia, you know, time-lapse photography is a technique of frequency uh, film capture. But really what it boils down is we were trying to condense days of activity down into minutes or uh, several minutes of video. So in a dairy, we were looking at, you know, the life, the day in the life of a cow uh, into several minutes. Uh, and we, uh, to try to get those animal behavior things. And the other thing was to a big chunk of why we looked at video or time lapse was to try to remove people from the equation. Um, when we're dealing with cows, a lot of times we put an observer in the barn and just the fact that there's somebody there changes the way cows behave. You know, the adage of, you know, uh, observation changes behavior. Um, so this was a video and, uh, are one of the videos that we've captured and you can see as it flies by this is fairly quickly I've condensed it down but this is really what we're after it's a 20 out 24 hours of time captured in a couple minute video of what's going on inside the dairy barn so the goal I had for the day at least was to give you a little bit of a history of how we have arrived at the techniques that we're using here at Penn State, and then to show a couple of examples of how I've used time lapse uh, to solve issues on dairy farms. So, in history, we started this project probably clear back in about 2004. Um, it was myself and three other ag engineers got a seed grant from Penn State 
And our goal was to try to video the inside of dairy barns and start or begin studying animal behavior in common dairy barns in Pennsylvania. We wound up with that grant buying nine cameras, uh, three, video, three desktops, uh, tons of extension cords, and a couple of ladders. And it was a quasi wireless video system, security system. Um, it was somewhat wireless, but we also strung a lot of um, cable around through barns. And I always tell people that the project was a combination of a giant failure and great success. Um, the giant failure was out of a summer, or more than six months worth of work, I think we wound up with about, I don't know, 10 minutes worth of video total. Um, hardly any amount of video, but what we really figured out was what we needed to capture uh, to do work inside the barn, to do uh, studies of animal behavior. And from that, you know, we started to develop some other ideas that maybe we didn't need security cameras, but just stick to, to, to photos. So a couple of years later, finally, Dan McFarland, another ag engineer here in PA, he came up with what I call the camera box, which was nothing more than a Nikon camera uh, crudely mounted inside of a plywood box with a plexiglass front to it. Um, and you could go out and screw this up inside of a, a dairy shelter, dairy barn. Um, and it would capture individual videos. You'd uh, crawl up your ladder and screw it onto the, to the post. Unfortunately, we still needed to bring in some type of external power so you can see that orange extension cord. Um, we were still running extension cords around through the rafters trying to keep them out of the reach of animals. Um, duct taping cords together to make sure that the cords didn't fall apart and uh, you'd go back two days later and find your cord dangling there and everything had shut down. Um, so it really was just a camera inside a box. It took individual pictures on a timer. Uh, we were somewhat limited by um, that in space. You know, after I forget how many images it would capture and the timer would, we ran out of timer. Um, and then ultimately what you wound up with was just thousands and or hundreds and thousands of pictures uh, on the camera and you still needed to get some type of electric there. A couple years later, we evolved into a product from Wingscape, comes from, uh, it's a bird watching camera is what it was sold as, but we kind of adapted it to cow watching. Uh, it was powered by batteries, so it had, uh, I think, four AA batteries it would, would run off of. It was either four or six. It, once again, it took individual pictures that you were stuck with, you know, thousands of pictures, depending how long you let it run. And probably it's what really, was its downfall was it a it ate up batteries very quickly but it had a limited field of view and and a vision um, and you can see here this is some pictures out of those wingscapes they really didn't have a very wide angle lens to them and even though barns were well lit we still couldn't capture very good cam very good pictures they were really meant for outdoor use and didn't work very well inside facilities uh, and we had, we got limited success with them, but we really struggled with the quality of photos they were taking. Um, so what we finally wound up with clear a few years ago, about 2014, we stumbled upon, same thing, Justin's using a, a Brino construction camera meant to time-lapse video of construction sites. It's powered off of four AA batteries and has exceptionally good battery life, depending on the capture rates. Um, it puts the pictures, can, can packs those pictures into a short video and saves them onto an SD card. And basically, I've said this product is kind of a hang it and forget it type thing. Um, I've had some of these that are running for as much as eight weeks uh, during the summer when it's not real cold. The battery life's even better yet, uh, capturing video of, of construction sites. So then I just wanted to throw, throw a couple examples up of different things we've done or I've done with them. Uh, this was a dairy herd that they built a new freestall shelter in 2014, but they were really having issues with um, cows bunching during the heat times of the summer of 2015. So I installed the cameras for several days. We went back, looked at those pictures, and then we made some changes uh, to the plant, to the fan placement, and then once again, left the cameras run. And these are just some screen captures of individual photos uh, from those videos. And you can see that, you know, it was 87 degrees uh, July 26th, 
and you can see at 2 a.m. The, the cows were using all the stalls fairly well, but as the time went on, 7 a.m., they were starting to not use the feed bunk. By 1 o'clock, all the stalls were empty, and at, two, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, an entirety of 150 cow free stall barn was piled up at one end of the barn. We made those changes to the fans um, and went back in a couple days later. You know, so this is three days after the changes were made and captured the same times of 2 a.m., 7, 1 p.m., and 3 p.m. And while the stall usage isn't perfect at 3 p.m., we knew that we were on the right track uh, of heat abatement because the temperature that day was actually a few degrees higher. So we had proven to ourselves that what we had done in this barn was working. And uh, actually the farmer told me that he didn't need the cameras for the second barn. He already made the changes by the time I went back to get my camera. Uh, he said, I already flipped the fans in the other barn. You don't need to take any pictures over there. So um, just one use of, of what we were seeing. Another was, uh, once again, heat abatement that same summer in another farm, neighbor to this one. Uh, we installed the cameras once again to just kind of watch what was going on. The day I was there and walked through the barn, you know, I found air speeds were very good. The evaporative cooling system was running. I couldn't understand why these cows uh, were bunching. And then I hung the camera and as you know, 9 to noon to 3.30 to 7.30, what we had figured out was the cows were, you know, once again, leaving this end of the barn. When I went back and started reviewing some other things, the camera was, you know, I could watch these fans as to when they came on. And we figured out that the fans weren't coming on till well over 70 degrees. I could, you know, see the fan sitting still and not running. Um, we made some changes, lowered that starting time or the starting temperature down to 60 degrees, and this was the result. Once again, uh, the cows not perfect at 7 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but much better than they were before. So we were addressing some issues on an individual farm. Um, one last example was putting these up to monitor feed bunk usage and uh, stall usage, and this was a, a capture of a uh, photo that I then sent back to the producer of, you know, this was nine hours after after milking and still had a large percentage of cows that were just standing in free stalls. Uh, the bunk was empty and cows were standing there wanting something to eat. Since that point in time, the farm has changed their feeding procedure um, and they are investigating or at least pricing out some changes in, in the stalls and, and making some other modifications. Two other quick examples, I don't have any pictures of these, um, was cow flow returned from a parlor. Um, we, I positioned the camera in such a way that I could watch as the first cow would leave the barn and the last cow to come back. Um, and what we saw was the way the gates were being set by the employees that cows were not allowed to return to the feed alley, but instead were going to the free stalls. And what we saw were cows would come back from the parlor and lay down rather than go eat. Um, made some changes just in the way the the employees uh, moved cows around, and we did gain a few few pounds of production out of that group of cows. Um, then on another farm, we looked at time away from the pen once again, watching the the gates at the end of the barn. So it was more of a focus on when cows started to leave and when cows started to come back, and you know. The farm had the assumption that cows were only out of the barn for 45 minutes to an hour. What they found out was cows were out of the barn for more like two, two and a half hours at a time. Um, so we went back in, addressed the way they move animals around, and and they didn't really gain much production out of that, but we did gain a lot of lying time because we had less time with the cows lay, or standing around on concrete. So herd health got a little bit better. Unfortunately, we didn't gain any production out of it, but I um, think there's some other issues that need addressed above and beyond that one from the production side. But um, So I didn't really make a list of do's and don'ts, but I would agree 100% with some of the things that Justin said on batteries, um, particularly spend the money, use good batteries. Uh, being the cheap person I am, I, I tried some of the alkaline batteries early on and you know could get a few days out of them at best. Uh, went to the lithium ions and basically, you know, I'm getting weeks uh, of pictures taken before the batteries go dead. 
If you're going to use these cameras indoors, probably the only thing I would say is mount them high away from animals and then angle them down. Um, we seem to get less dust attracted to that screen if it's on a bit of an incline. When we, if you mount them straight up and down, the, the lens surface tends to gather a lot of dust in some of these dairy facilities. And after a, you know, a week's worth of time, you're basically trying to stare through a mud, through mud rather than uh, being able to see anything. But uh, software wise, I simply just use the little app that came with the cameras. Um, I think it's called Video Viewer. It, uh, one of the neat things is it allows you to change the frame rate that you're watching it at. So if you want to watch it very quickly, you can turn the frame rate up to 30 frames a second. If you get to a part of the video that you really want to watch, start watching for details, you can slow it down to a few frames a second and, and basically slow that time lapse down and you'll start to pick up more and more details. But uh, then I, what I usually wind up doing is capturing individual photos to then make a report and send back to the farm. Uh, really not try not, at this point in time, not making uh, uh, products out of it for YouTube videos, but basically just reports back to individual farms. Um, so I'm not great at um, giving presentations. Just thought I'd open now, open it up for questions. Thank you so much, John, for sharing. Does anyone have questions for John? I found it interesting for both of you that through all your trial and error, you came to the same conclusion regarding the same camera. And for all of you, we, we were just, um, asking for recommendations on speakers on this topic and so we had no idea what each individual speaker was using so i, I found that interesting justin and john well and i had a comment on the, the person there to ask about the hunting and trail cameras they they could be used we tried one of those trail cameras the problem we had with it was the quality of photo uh, and maybe it was just the the camera we had um, was, you know, the pixel rate or whatever of the camera was very low and you couldn't see much. <laughs> um, that was our disillusion at, at, at hunting cameras where they just didn't give us very good quality photos. Um, then when we found this Brino, it, it seems to work. So There is a question regarding how could the Brino cam be used for horn fly counts? Yeah, um, so I guess if, uh, if, you were, if you had a target that you could place, and, and I'm not super familiar with horn flies and how they're sampled for, um, but if you had, say, a sticky trap system and wanted to know counts over time or could indirectly relate that activity on cattle, um, that, that camera, and in fact, there's a, a company uh, Spensa Technologies that has one for insects and agricultural crops uh, and that frame rate capture over time could could tell you seasonal activity or daily activity, diurnal activity, um, or if you had some sort of treatment you were using for attractants, uh, that might be the case. On the cattle themselves, it'd be pretty tricky just because of the distance you'd have to be away from the cattle. And um, So that one's a a challenging one. Some of these, you, you get a camera, you say, okay, this is what I want to do, and you try several approaches to get there. Um, but I aim for something like a sticky trap of some kind if, if there was a, a suitable attractant to pull them towards that. And you can feel free to unmute your microphones if you have follow-up questions at all. Another yeah. question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, uh, you know, John could probably answer this one too. As far as the solar panels, that's a great idea. Um, I've actually never tried to plug in the cameras to anything just because of where I've been located. It's almost always been something related to, to battery use. 
um, I, I, John's cameras are more, or I, I guess you were using older cameras that could have been plugged in, but uh, you know, with these, the, the cost of those batteries are, are relatively cheap uh, and afford a lot of use. I've, I've never tried it. It's a good question. Uh, Brino is great at, at answering questions like that. So uh, it's worth just going on, hitting their chat and saying, this is something I'd like to do. Have you guys ever explored this? Uh, they, they provide a lot of insight. John, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I've, I've never tried the solar power or solar power with the Brinos. What I've found is my, usually the SD card runs out of storage before I run out of battery power. So I need to go back to download it before I have to touch the batteries. We did try the solar power. I tried solar panels with the wingscapes and my issue, I had as many more issues with the solar panel than the camera. Um, trying to get the angle to collect enough of, of light and I was using them inside of a building so I found myself trying to mount the solar panel outside and then I had to run a cord back inside so it, it got frustrating as to I was back to stringing cords around through the barn and it just wasn't worth the effort maybe if you were outside um, but I just mentioned that the price of the batteries versus the price of the solar panel um, the batteries just seem to be an easier way to go on these Brinos anyway. But I, I think they do have a external power port um, that could be used. I think you're right, John. I just never used it. <laughs> yeah. I, if I remember right on the side of the camera, it says something about DC source, but I, you know, I never investigated any further than I think there's a port for it. <laughs> uh, what? One comment on the, the dues, if you do decide to put these in the field, uh, do place a large flag next to them, uh, one that's visible all season long. Uh, I was mentioning before this talk started, I put one out in a winter wheat field uh, at about head level while I was a graduate student uh, to look at you know, development of the heads over time. Uh, and my camera went missing because it was still extending in height. And so I walked and walked that field uh, and at the end of the season, the uh, combine found it, uh, which we were really trying to find the SD card for that because that would have been one awesome time lapse camera or time lapse shot. Uh, so I had a flag; it was not tall enough. So tall flags and GPS them with your phone. Uh, that's another good way to find them. Yeah, I really appreciate all your tips and tricks from both of you and do's and don'ts and your experiences because that's how we also all learn as well. For those of you who joined us today, do any of you have experiences that you'd like to share or um, equipment that you're using that you found successful? You know, Jenny, not specifically with time-lapse cameras, but GoPro cameras um, can be a really useful field. Um, you, I think you guys saw the one video, uh, or I guess it was a screenshot uh, in uh, Camtasia of uh, those types of cameras, but uh, collecting any type of information or explaining a process or a scouting, um, you know, if, if you... Uh, are so inclined to, to spend the three or four hundred dollars on those things. They're well worth every penny. Um, you can buy a gimbal with them. Uh, there's G3 or G4 gimbals. Uh, it's like a video, it stabilizes your camera as you walk across the field. It really looks like you're shooting like this high quality, you know, cinematic film, uh, but a great way of explaining scouting or what you're finding. Uh, so just another aspect of this and the Camtasia could be used for the same process to edit those types of films and make standalone products. Just a, another possibility. Yeah, and that's, that's good that you brought that up. We had a crop consultant that used a GoPro in a field because we were actually documenting night crawler activity um, in this field. We were seeing all these trails 
and things. So it was interesting catching the night crawler activity and then the differences it made with after a rainfall event and things like that. Uh, you, you mentioned nighttime shots. We've been trying to sort out and we've got um, the capability to do it. It's so a power source is an issue, but we've done uh, um, night vision time lapse with the Brino cameras. So using an 850 nanometer wavelength, uh, you can actually be in pitch black and still see with those. Um, which is pretty cool for some of that nighttime activity. We're particularly interested in pitfall traps and insect capture over the course of the night and when most of that occurs, when most activity occurs, or on sentinel prey uh, cards for, for predators. Uh, but uh, they require a tremendous amount of power, <laughs> which is uh, difficult to have in the field. But uh, if you're doing this in a, in a greenhouse setting or where you have access to a plug-in, uh, or even you know, in, the, in the case of John's example, uh, those security cameras, uh, you can purchase lights for those, and at least the TLC 200 Pro will pick up that, that type of light source, uh, which is pretty amazing. They're capable of doing it, considering their red, green, blue, uh, you know, capture spectrum. But anyway, another tidbit of information. Yeah, that's good to know. Are there any other... We don't need to keep you another 15 minutes if no one else has any additional questions. I'll just do one last final call for any additional questions or comments or um, final comments from our presenters. Any any final comments from you, Stan or Matt? Just thanks to both our presenters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Thank you again for the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks again for invite for the invite. Absolutely. So we are going to, we recorded this, so we'll go ahead and um, share that with the, with NACAA listserv so we can share that out and more people will be able to, to view it from there. Thank you again, Justin and John. Really appreciate your presentations, what you've learned, and um, your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.